Let us hear the word of God in Isaiah 40. To whom will ye liken God, or what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold and casteth silver chains. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? Beloved saints, our help is in the name of the God who made heaven and earth. And may his grace and mercy and peace be upon you all. Amen. Let us now read and hear the Holy Scriptures in Daniel chapter 3. We read the whole of this narrative in Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the sheriffs, the treasurers, the counselors, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshippeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, o king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? And if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made? Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, 
nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel, and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let us bow together in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, all power belongs to thee. Thou hast an arm and a hand which is mighty. Thou art the one who governs all things, and mankind in his totality is vain. All the nations before thee are as a drop of a bucket, like tiny locusts scurrying upon the face of the earth. For thou art the one who stretched out the heavens, who placed the stars and the planets in their positions with intricate care with thy fingers, as it were. The God who is timeless, the God who eternally counsels all things, and they come to pass, and everything is entirely under thy sovereign, almighty control. We confess this about ourselves, Father. We know and we feel ourselves to be flesh, weak and frail. We know our origin from thy hand, as Genesis 1 explains, and from the dust of the earth. And we are dust, and unto dust we will all return, unless Christ comes first and changes us in the twinkling of an eye. We thank thee, Lord God, for thy grace that sought us out, a 
grace given us in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, a grace which opened our eyes that we may know thee, the God who not only creates and orders all things, but the judge of all men, the God who searches the deep parts of man's heart, even to give to every one according as his thoughts and motives, as well as his deeds are, and the God who is always perfectly just and holy and pure. We worship thee as the incomparable one, the incomprehensible one, the God who knows all the thoughts of men afar off, and the one who is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the God who dwells in perfect fellowship and joy and peace in thyself. God who's never lonely, never shut up, but always filling thyself, and indeed filling all things. Heaven is thy throne, earth is thy footstool. And we ask, Lord God, for thy rich fellowship, the fellowship which we enjoy only through faith, in believing in thee as the invisible God, the God who is not known, but yet well known, and the God who knows us, and the God whom we know through Jesus Christ. We thank thee that we are bonded to thee by the Holy Spirit, that our faith given to us by thee through the Spirit reaches out to thee, seeks thee, and finds thee, desires none else beside thee. And we know that thou hast given us a faith that receives, a faith that draws near, a faith that makes real the promises, that beholds the invisible God, and that joins us to thee, so that we, Lord God, dwell in thee, and thou art the God who dwells in us. For thou, Lord God, art our fortress, the one who lifts up our head, the God who is our strong tower, our refuge, and under thy wings this morning we find rest and peace. We thank thee, Lord God, that thou hast kept us health-wise, that thou hast kept our children and our older folk and those who struggle with health issues which make them particularly vulnerable to this present blight which thou, o God, dost send in thy sovereignty and in thy wisdom, and also too in thy justice, to remind us that this world is not right with thee, that sin blights it, that thy curse lies heavenly upon it, and that thou art the God with whom every human being has to do, the God who sends plagues upon the earth because of the great plague that is in man's heart, the plague of sin, which is far worse and which no one cares about at all. We confess, Lord God, our sins, our evil natures, our wicked thoughts. We confess that we forget thee. We confess that we're puffed up when things go well for us, that we attribute them to ourselves and our own wisdom and goodness and strength. And we confess, Lord God, that we have done things which are evil, and there were things which thou didst tell us to do, and we didn't do them. And there were sins which we committed that we covered up. And there were sins which we committed and we even rejoiced in them. We pray, Lord God, for our land. And we ask, Lord, that thou would forgive the church. That thou, Lord God, would create a turning back to thee in this land and the rest of the United Kingdom in the British Isles and in Europe and around the world, that the Bride of Christ may use this opportunity and this common humbling of the human race to draw near to thee, to purge ourselves of our sins in the blood of Jesus Christ, to be clean, to be washed, and to know that thou art the God who gives righteousness even the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ to those who confess their sins and misery, to those who confess that there's no good in us, 
and to those who look entirely outside of themselves to the obedience and sacrifice, the suffering and the holiness and purity of Jesus Christ so that our hope lies in him, the Son of God who became flesh for us and who laid down his life for the sheep and not in ourselves. We ask, Lord God, that thou would bless to us the reading of sacred scripture earlier and the exposition of that word, that we may hear it and believe, that we may tremble, that thy word may comfort our hearts. And we pray, Lord God, that thou would uplift us and that thou would draw near to us as we draw near to thee. We ask, Lord God, for the whole of our congregation, for all who join us live online now, or will perhaps listen or watch later. For the saints in Limerick, grant thy consolation to them. And for our sister churches in America and Canada and Singapore, we pray, Father, for the Protestant Reformed churches in the Philippines, we ask, Lord God, that all of these saints joined with us in various shapes and forms would be edified today in difficult circumstances and that with the entire mystical body of Jesus Christ. For we know not even a hundredth or a thousandth or even a millionth of the true Church of Christ on the earth and every nation assembling together as best they can probably most in their homes to draw near to thee, the great God and Saviour. Work thy good purposes, Father. Sanctify us in this Lord's day. May it still to us be a gift and a means of growth. And we ask, Lord, that thou would give us strength in our souls so that being rooted and grounded in faith, that is, rooted and grounded in Christ, the object of our faith, we may stand in an evil day, and we bring honour and praise to thee, our God. Grant these things, Father. Grant them more than we desire them, because we say in Jesus' name, Amen. Before we look at Daniel 3, those of you who wish to sing together in your homes, I wish to choose a psalm that's appropriate, with especially this word this morning. You could do worse than turn to Psalm 137 by the rivers of Babylon and Psalm 115, which contrasts the true God who always does all his will in heaven and earth with the gods who are just wood and stone and gold and who can't see or hear. Daniel 3 verse 1 is our text. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. We're going to consider this verse of sacred scripture under the theme, the image erected by Nebuchadnezzar. The amazing account of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's preservation in the burning fiery furnace in Daniel 3 is well known not only from this word of God, but from other places too. This narrative is referred to in the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is not inspired. It's not canonical scripture. Belgic Confession Article 6 clearly teaches this and is dead right. These books written between the close of the Old Testament and the New Testament though not inspired, are of some value historically, though they, of course, contain mistakes. But our interest now is in 1 Maccabees 2, verse 59, which I quote, 
Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael believed and were saved out of the flame. So here's this later work referring back centuries to Daniel 3 as a well-known account. The New Testament, which is of course inspired, lists Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and refers to this sacred narrative in Daniel 3. It lists Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego among the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 as those who, quote, quenched the violence of fire. Hebrews 11 verse 34. Daniel 3. 1 Maccabees 2 in the uninspired Apocrypha and Hebrews 11. This narrative is also mentioned in many a children's Bible story book since it's easy to see why it appeals to them and it also appeals to us, even adults. There are two very impressive objects in Daniel 3 which we read earlier. There's Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. We're going to see a lot about it this morning. And then the burning, fiery furnace. Two impressive objects. Three faithful friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And a fourth figure. One like the Son of God, walking in the midst of the fire with them. According to Daniel 3 verse 25. But this last point forms part of the case against Daniel 3 on the part of the unbelieving and ungodly. It's just a children's story. No, it's not. It's an Old Testament sacred scripture. Daniel 3. And all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Literally, all scripture is God breathed. And it's therefore profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. As 2 Timothy 3 explains. In Old Testament scripture and New Testament scripture, as we heard, Hebrews 11. It's not pagan mythology, like silly fables about Zeus or Hercules, though they're entertaining. But it's solid, biblical, trustworthy history. And to return to that reference in the Apocrypha in 1 Maccabees 2, Verse 59, the three friends and their ordeal in the burning fiery furnace is not presented as if this was something just recently made up. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in 1 Maccabees 2 are spoken of immediately after references to the faith and good works of Abraham and Joseph, and Phineas, and Joshua, and Caleb, and David, and Elijah, that is, historical figures from centuries before. And then are mentioned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. First Maccabees 2 isn't referring to some foolish, propaganda work that had been forged a couple of years previously, a couple of years before 1 Maccabees was written, as is the unbelieving higher critical theory, which explains practically nothing and is riddled with holes. Instead, authenticity shines through Daniel 3. And where appropriate in this sermon, I'm going to highlight that 
And it will also crop up, though not as much probably, in later sermons on this great chapter. Now we're going to look at the image erected by Nebuchadnezzar. First, the image itself, in Daniel 3 verse 1. Second, its relationship to the image in Daniel 2. We're widening out now. And then third, its fulfillment in the image of Revelation 13. And we're going quite a bit wider, even a wideness of eschatology and the end of all things. The image erected by Nebuchadnezzar. The image itself, its relationship to the image in Daniel 2, and its fulfillment in the image of Revelation 13. Let's look closely at the image in Daniel 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. What was the form of this image? Was it an obelisk? Were its surfaces flat? Was it six cubits broad all the way up? Or was it the case that it was six cubits broad at its base, but then it narrowed or tapered as it approached the top? Or was it not an obelisk as such, but was its form human? And the word which is used of this image suggests this. Because an image is an image of something. And an obelisk, a lump of stone that's flat, either going all the way up straight or tapering, an obelisk is hardly an image of something. And if this is an image, an image of something, it's probably an image of a human form. That, of course, raises the question, was the image of human form at the top of this huge monument, or was it all the way up a somewhat stylized human form? which would appear particularly grotesque. But then the Babylonians did the grotesque. They were into it. The form I propose to you was human. Though absolute certainty is probably impossible. What about the material of the image? It was gold. And that fits with Nebuchadnezzar and his mighty world empire, the Babylonian Empire, because they were rich. It wasn't solid gold, though. The volume of this image would preclude that. It's 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. That is some volume. And if it were solid gold, that would be some weight. Instead, and all the authorities go this way, so far as I can tell, instead, we are to conceive of this image as being gold-plated. Let me read some verses first from Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verse 19, quoted at the very start. The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold. The goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold. Chapter 41, verse 7. The carpenter encouraged the goldsmith. Both of those men working together and forming an idol. The carpenter, or the craftsman, he encourages the goldsmith who takes the lump 
of the idol and then applies gold to it. Isaiah 46, verse 6, and this is referring to Babylonian idolatry. They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith and he maketh it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship. And this gold plating of idols is mentioned also in Jeremiah 10. The customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the works, workman with the axe. There you've got wood, a tree chopped down. They deck it or decorate it with silver and with gold. The golden image, probably in human form, plated with gold. What about the height of this image? We're told 60 cubits. The cubit is about one and a half feet, which means this statue was about 90 feet high or 30 yards or about 27 meters. How high? is 90 feet. It's the height of 15 tall men, meaning by a tall man about six foot. 15 men high. In our auditorium this morning, the highest point of the ceiling, I would guess, is about 25 feet. I can look at that and imagine that three times higher and almost four times higher. That is some statue. My neck would be craned to about that sort of an angle. If the statue were at the end of that wall, the back wall, is 90 feet tall for a statue or an image? Well, the Colossus of Rome, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it was reckoned to be about 98 or 105 feet high. A couple of estimates that I read about, let's just say 100 feet high. So the Colossus of Rhodes would have been a little bit taller. The Statue of Liberty, if we think of the statue itself without its base or plinth, the Statue of Liberty is some 151 feet high. So it's about 50% higher or 50% again compared to this statue of Nebuchadnezzar's. To come a little bit nearer to home, Nelson's Column in Trafalgar Square in London is 169 feet and three inches tall. It's made up of three main parts. There's the base or pedestal. Then there's the column. It's called Nelson's column for a reason. And then there's Nelson himself as a statue on top. So there's the base, then the column, then the statue of the man himself atop. So we have 90 feet for Nebuchadnezzar's golden image, 100 feet for the Colossus of Rhodes, 151 feet for the Statue of Liberty, 169 feet for Nelson's Column, and those statues are dwarfed by some of the other huge monuments in various parts of the world. The Indians and the Chinese especially seem to be into grand statues. But we get the picture that Nebuchadnezzar's statue was tall, but it was doable. And it was made. What about the shape of this image? If we think of a golden image 90 feet high as unsupported, then we have an image of something like a needle 
sticking up into the sky, 60 cubits tall, 40 cubits, 6 cubits wide. That's a ratio of 10 to 1. Maybe it tapered a bit, as I said earlier. That is not a picture of stability, though. Though no doubt, with clever engineering, it could be done. And so most reckon that this golden image had a platform or a pedestal or a base like the Statue of Liberty and like Nelson's column. With Nelson's column, as I said, a pedestal and a column and a top that a statue of the great naval commander. Now you will have noticed the numbers associated with this image. The number six. Six zero cubits high. Six cubits broad. And here again we see the authenticity because Babel, the Babylonian counting system was sexagesimal. Sexagesimal. It worked in sixes. You're familiar with binary. You have zero and one. Zero and one. So combinations of zeros and ones give you the number. We work, of course, in the decimal systems. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then we have a one and a zero. We go into the second column. Our system, it was also the system of the ancient Egyptians. But in Babylon, it was six agesimel. Six. One, two, three, four, five. And then add one, and you go one, zero. And then one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six. No, you don't go one, six, you go two, zero. I'm using, of course, our digits. Ten for us, six for them. And the influence of ancient Babel on us is that our counting of time, we have 60 minutes in an hour. We owe that to the Babylonians. 60 minutes in an hour. And, and with angles, we have 360 degrees in a circle. And here we are in Daniel, and we see again the sexagesimal system. The image of 60 cubits, that's its height, by 6 cubits, that's its breadth, in Daniel 3 verse 1, and we're in Babylon. It's worth reading at this point, Ezekiel 40 verse 5, Ezekiel 40 verse 5, another biblical book set in Babylon, where Ezekiel was carried off captive, we read there of the measuring rod, which was six cubits long. And I repeat, the use of this number six again points to the authenticity, as one would expect, it's God's word, the authenticity of Daniel. Why would a second century forger use such numbers? But a sixth century Daniel in Babylon, where such a structure was actually built, erected by Nebuchadnezzar and his men, makes perfect sense. What shall we say then about the location of this image? We're told it was set up in the plain of Dura. Dura means a walled place or an enclosing wall. And Dura is of common usage and occurrence in Babylon. Authenticity. The plain of Dura, the word here rendered plain, refers to a broad, flat plain surrounded by mountains. So that we have here a sort of natural arena. And the plain of Dura 
is in the province of Babylon. So it's not too far from the capital city because the province of Babylon embraced the city of Babylon, an ideal site close to the capital, a natural arena, flat with this statue, an image in the middle, surrounded by mountains. And all of this, of course, leads us to the brilliance of the image because we're dealing here with a land of sunlight. We're talking here about the province of Babylon and not the province of Ulster. We have a tall gold-plated image reflecting the light, as gold will do, as well as anything almost. And this tall gold-plated image is in a broad plain surrounded by mountains. And it's clear that Nebuchadnezzar, who was a very wise as well as powerful man, had thought this thing through. He has erected an impressive image in the right place, this natural amphitheater, close to his capital city, capturing and reflecting the rays of the sun. And it's all designed to impress others with his and Babylon's power. We all agree that Daniel 3, and especially now our focus this morning, verse 1, is meant to be read and understood in light of Daniel 2, the immediately preceding chapter which deals with Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue or image made of four metals. You see, the similarities between these two images are inescapable. They're both called images. And in the Aramaic, I didn't say Hebrew, because remember Daniel 2 through 7 is Aramaic, not Hebrew. In the Aramaic, the same word is used for the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the image which Nebuchadnezzar builds. And then we have gold mentioned in both. Gold is the first metal in Daniel 2 and the metal in Daniel 3. They both deal with gold images. Gold images that were bright. Daniel 2 verse 31 Daniel's word to Nebuchadnezzar. Thou, O king, sawest in thy dream, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. And lo and behold, Nebuchadnezzar later builds a gold-plated image in the sunny plain of Dura. Brightness. Now, though the similarities between these two images are inescapable, there are differences too, and the differences are deliberate. Deliberate in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar himself. The image of Daniel 3 verse 1, our text, is only of one metal, that metal being gold, because Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon were the head of gold in the image of Daniel 2. The image of Daniel 3 verse 1 is not succeeded by silver, bronze, or iron. Unlike the image of Daniel 2, it's only gold. And it's not just gold at the top, but it's gold all the way down. Because Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, according to the way he wants the future to go, is not going to be succeeded by any other emperors, empires. Though, of course, he was wrong. The image of Daniel 3 verse 1 stands 
It's not smashed into tiny pieces. It's not destroyed by a stone cut out without hands, symbolizing Christ, with that stone then becoming a great mountain which fills the earth, referring to his everlasting and global kingdom of the elect or Catholic Church. The images then of Daniel 2 and Daniel 3 also differ in this regard. One was a dream given by God, while the other was a structure made by man, Nebuchadnezzar. And so to make one final point in this regard, the images of Daniel 2 and Daniel 3 also differ as to whom they are or were designed to glorify. Daniel 2, that image and that dream were to glorify God and his kingdom which destroyed the world kingdoms of man. Whereas the image of Daniel 3 is designed to glorify Nebuchadnezzar himself and his kingdom of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar built it. He built it in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. He made it. Its height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof sixty cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And so now we need to see what has happened between Daniel 2 and particularly now the end of Daniel 2. And Daniel 3 verse 1. What has happened is well explained in Romans 1 verse 18. Romans 1 18 says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And here hold means hold down. Man holds down the truth in unrighteousness. And to hold down is to suppress. Man, and here Nebuchadnezzar holds down and suppresses the truth. That's what he did between the end of Daniel 2 and the beginning of of chapter 3 in verse 1. He held down and suppressed the truth that God had given to him, revealed to him, made clear to him. And he held it down by substitution. As Romans 1.23 goes on to explain. It says that idolaters changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and the birds, four-footed beasts and creeping things. The truth about God and his absolute sovereignty over world kingdoms and the future was presented in the image of Daniel 2. But then Nebuchadnezzar in his twisted fallen, depraved heart builds the image of chapter 3 verse 1 as a sort of a substitute image, as a substitute truth, his own truth to speak in terms used by many in the 21st century. He invented his own truth and his own truth was much more conducive to his own carnal, foolish heart. It was a sort of replacement theology. God says, the truth is presented with this image in chapter 2, and the stone, which becomes a mountain, which refers to the kingdom of God in the last times, and then Nebuchadnezzar's replacement theology is, no, here's the truth, my truth, the golden image, and everybody has to worship that. Replacement theology. A theology designed to replace what God had taught him in the previous chapter. 
There is the terrible change. In chapter 2, verse 47, Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods over all the gods. And he's a Lord of kings over all human rulers and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Nebuchadnezzar has been astounded and startled by this amazing dream and its clear, honest interpretation is given by the prophet Daniel and he makes formally a good confession. God, as it were, has grabbed him by the throat and shook this confession out of him, though he's not regenerate. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, he makes an image of gold, 60 cubits by 6 cubits, sets it up in the plain of Dura, and as later verses in the chapter go on to explain, especially verses 5 through 7, he calls everybody in his dominion to worship the golden image. He suppressed and held down the truth and unrighteousness by substituting his own replacement theology, his own truth, because he couldn't cope with the truth of God. This is Nebuchadnezzar in his pride, in his rebellion, in his idolatry, and in his folly. Let's move to our third and final point, beloved. All idolatry finds its pinnacle and its climax in the worship of the man of sin and the son of perdition just prior to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Tower of Babel, where men were going to build their own kingdom and ascend up into heaven. Molech, Baal, Ashtaroth and all the deities mentioned in the Old Testament. Even the king of Tyre. A lot of idolatry there. Self-worship in Ezekiel 28. We looked at that some months ago. Throw into the mix all the idolatry of Old Testament Israel, including the golden calf at Mount Sinai, the house of Micah and the tribe of Dan in Judges 17 and 18. We looked also at those two chapters. The shrines at Dan in the north and Bethel in the south. Throw in too, to come to New Testament days, the idolatry of the false church with its heretical doctrines and corrupt worship. Rome, Eastern Orthodoxy with its icons, apostate, Protestantism. And then we have the whole plethora of pagan religions, ancient and modern. And of course, the idolatry of secular man with all of his pride and self-deception and self-deification. Idolatry, global for centuries and millennia, and it all reaches a peak in the great idolatry in the worshipping of the Antichrist. And now here, the image worship of Daniel 3 verse 1 is especially part of this idolatry which points to the worship of the beast as its culmination and perfection. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist. And Babylon, his kingdom, is a picture of the anti-Christian kingdom. One only has to think, for example, of the use of Babylon in the book of Revelation. Let me read to you 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, his second coming, that day shall not come except there come the falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. Nothing else is to be worshipped but him alone. And then we have in Revelation chapter 13, these famous words about the image of the beast. The second beast, the false prophet, says, Revelation 13, verse 14, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And here we remember the impressive image of Nebuchadnezzar of vast size, 60 cubits, some 90 feet high, made of precious metal, plated with gold. The brilliant reflection of this image as the sun's rays shine upon it. In this ideal setting, this natural amphitheater in the plain of Dura. And you say, that's an impressive image. We can understand, given the depravity and blindness of man's heart and the circumstances, we'll say more about that in the next sermon on Daniel 3, Lord willing. We can understand why totally depraved men would bow down and worship. But the image of the beast in Revelation 13 is presented as being much more powerful and impressive. The image of the beast lives. The image of the beast speaks. The image of the beast kills. A living, speaking, killing image. And everyone must bow. He had power to give life unto the image of, be of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And here it's even worth mentioning the numbers again. We said that the number, number six occurs twice in Daniel 3 verse 1. Six zero cubits high and six cubits broad. Well, the number six occurs thrice in Revelation 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. And his number is six hundred three score and six. Six, six, six. And seven is the number of the covenant. And six is man falling short. Falling short, six. Falling short, six. Falling short, six. And he falls short by sinning. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. And so the number six is also suggested. Two sixes in the image of Daniel 3, verse 1. The first verse of Daniel 3. Three sixes. Three sixes in Revelation 13, verse 18. The last verse in Revelation 13. And Revelation 13, verse 8 says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. That is terrible. All that dwell on the earth shall worship him. But the good news is that they're all going to worship him except those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And that's where our salvation lies. Our salvation lies in the Lamb of God. We have redemption in the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb slain 
the lamb slain for our sins. Here's substitution, not man substituting a lie for the truth of God, as Romans 1 speaks of and has happened with Nebuchadnezzar, with the two images of chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Daniel, but Christ as the substitute for us, dying for our sins. Salvation by substitution. And not only are we redeemed in the Lamb of God and by him, but we are elected in the Lamb of God, written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, eternally chosen in Jesus Christ, the redeemed and the elect won't worship the image of the beast. We are also preserved in holiness and from idolatry by that Lamb of God. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, which means that those whose names are written in the book of the life of the Lamb will not worship him. Not one of them. They can't. That's the perseverance of the saints. Persevering in keeping the first commandment despite all the opposition and hatred and threats of the ungodly. The Lamb of God, beloved, is the true image of God. Not the image of Daniel 3 verse 1, not the image of Revelation 13. The Lamb is the image of God. He is personally God, fully God, God the Son, he is God and man, fully God and fully man, as the Son of God and the Son of Man. And he is the clear image of God, the bright and glorious image of God. Let me read to you some verses in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. The God of this world, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And that's what the devil was doing through that image in Daniel 3 verse 1. Bright, glorious light reflecting from that image. He was blinding the minds of them which believe not, lest the far greater light and glory of Christ would shine. Chapter 4, verse 6. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So chapter 3 verse 18 says, We all with open unveiled face, beholding as in a glass or mirror the glory of the Lord Jesus, are changed into the same image of Christ and of God from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And our calling is to believe in him and so believe in the triune God and to worship him as the revelation of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the God of our salvation. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, speak to us through thy word that we may hear the voice of Jesus Christ that we may keep the first commandment and have no other gods but thee. Enable us as thy little children to keep ourselves from idols and to see the light and glory, the divine effulgence and majesty in Jesus Christ our Lord. And may his grace and thy love and fellowship be with us this day. Amen.